Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe out of there. My name is Victoria, and I'm a Senior Business Development Coordinator to H Offshore. With many industry events and conferences canceled due to COVID-19, we've put together this series of live webinars to keep our valued clients and colleagues up to date on the latest happenings in the world of riser and conductor engineering. I want to welcome you all to our webinar today entitled, Addressing the Challenges of Top Tension Riser Life Extension. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few important housekeeping items. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available to you soon, so please look out for a link to that in your email. Secondly, if you have technical or content related questions today, please feel free to ask them at any time. You can use the Q&A box that is located on the right hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we'll go through as many questions as we can, but if you have further questions, feel free to contact our speaker directly after the presentation. So with that, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Deanne Decker. Deanne has over 14 years of experience in subsea design, integrity management, and life extension projects. He's based into H's Houston office, where he leads multiple engineering projects, as well as technology development programs such as the Stream and Tracks GIP. Deanne has authored and co-authored several conference publications and technical editorials. He also holds a master's, master of science degree in mechanical engineering from Ohio State University. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Deanne to get us started. Yeah, hello everybody. Hello, Victoria. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I'm excited to be here today to speak about TTR life extension challenges, and I hope that uh, everyone will find this presentation helpful. Uh, so with that, let me uh, tell you what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so first, I'll give you an introduction to the life extension problem. Uh, next, uh, very relevant are BSEE policies. So I'll talk about BSEE policies next. And uh, then and I'll go over the riser life extension process uh, at a high level and talk to you about uh, uh, the different steps that we need to take, like data review, inspections, analysis, etc. cetera. Um, then I will talk about Trax GIP, uh, which is a very relevant GIP that we have been involved with uh, for TTR life extension. And finally, I'll give you a summary of what I have talked about. Hey, DJ, I'm sorry. I'm just jumping in really quick. Could you move back? We can't see you. Yeah. Um, can, can you, you, can you move your camera down? We only see the top of your head, just FYI. There oh, you go. Uh -huh. OK, perfect. Okay. Sorry, I'm done. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Uh -huh. Thank you for of course. OK, thanks. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah, so uh, of course, risers are critical components. Uh, you know, uh, Bessie says, risers have the potential for single point failure with significant consequences. And uh, they, uh, in their uh, guidance and their uh, directives, they, it reflects that, you know, how uh, critical risers are. And uh, it is true. I mean, production riser failure, it can uh, result in grave consequences, not just financial, but more importantly, health and safety and environmental. So with that in mind, let me just talk about TTRs really quick. And uh, top tension risers are pretty popular in the Gulf of Mexico and elsewhere, like Indonesia or uh, even North Sea. And uh, top tension risers are either attached to spars or uh, TLPs. And there are some advantages with that. I mean, they provide direct access to the subsea well. So, uh, you know, you can control the well, which is a big thing. And uh, also, if you needed to do uh, drilling or work of our operations, then uh, you can do that through the TTR and save yourself some costs of uh, hiring a drilling vessel, for example. Uh, top tension risers are either supported by hydro pneumatic tensioners uh, for TLPs or by buoyancy cans, which uh, generally relate to spar uh, TTRs. And also, during the presentation, I will talk about dual casing TTRs and single casing TTRs. Uh, dual casing TTRs have an outer riser, uh, then there is an inner riser, and then inside the inner riser is the production tubing. Uh, while for single casing TTRs, there is no inner riser, uh, which is light, but again, it has one uh, less barrier. Um, Roughly 25 TTRs were installed prior to 2005, and you can imagine all of them are coming to the end of their life extension, uh, sorry, end of their design lives, and 
uh, operators have to decide whether to go ahead with life extension or decommissioning. So TTR life extension is a challenging task and it is uh, very well scrutinized by Bessie and uh, understandably so. So here I am showing you two TTR configurations. One is the tensioner, the hydropneumatic tensioner supported TTR on the left and the buoyancy can support a TTR on the right. Uh, they are pretty similar below the tensioners. I mean, if you go from bottom up, you got the type of connector, the stress joint, then you got the riser pipes and connectors. Uh, then you have the tensioners or the buoyancy can. With the buoyancy can, you get you get a, a lot of uh, different components. For example, the keel joint and you know the different guides that uh, guide the buoyancy can and the stem inside the hull. Uh, above the water line, you'll have the surface tree and you'll have the flexible uh, jumpers. Sometimes you even have the BOP if there's drilling going on. And all of these would be, these components, all of them would be, uh, uh, you know, in line for life extension if you're going to check it for life extension. So basic guidance and policies. Uh, Again, uh, as I said, Bessie closely scrutinizes this, and uh, riser life extension is typically uh, sent in a separate package from the other components of the asset. And TTRs are separately sent from other risers as well. Uh, TTRs are sent to the Bessie TAS, the Technology Assessment Section, and uh, for risers, or uh, actually all components basically mandates that you have a CVA, Certified Verification Agent, who checks all the analysis, all the inspections. And for risers only, uh, basically mandates that the CVA does an independent fatigue check and uh, you know confirms to themselves that the risers are fit for service in their extended lives. Um, another thing that basically says is, uh, your life extension has to be a combination of analysis and inspections. It cannot be just analysis alone. And uh, at the end of the life extension, you have to have an IM program in place, an integrity management program. I will talk about all this in a little, a little bit. I have slides for all of this. So uh, with TTRs and high pressure drilling risers, Bessie's uh, internal document says that they have the policy of uh, granting, you can see at the very top, for dual casing TTRs, uh, they're gonna grant you 25% of the original design life as life extension. Uh, if you do in-service inspection only. If you bring out the riser and you're able to do an out-of-service inspection, then the maximum life extension granted is higher at 50%. Um, single casing uh, basically says that will be on a case-by-case -case basis but I guess you can imagine that it will be more stringent than dual casing TTRs. Uh, uh, I have also put the drilling risers, the high pressure drilling risers over here. And it says that with an in-service inspection, there's not gonna be any life extension. And with out of service inspections and for dual casing only, uh, life extension can be granted. So uh, all in all, uh, Bessie has this in their internal document and this kind of gives you a window into what they think, uh, how they think. At the same time, Bessie is looking at the industry to develop uh, standardized life extension guidelines and to prove to them that, hey, probably you can have more life than, uh, you can operate safely for more than 25% of the original life if you have a proper risk-based inspection in place. And, uh, uh, and Trax GIP, for example, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, is uh, one of the avenues by which we are talking to Bessie about uh, this kind of stuff. Life extension process. Uh, here uh, I'm showing you a very uh, broad uh, life extension process. And you start with data review. You look at all the uh, data, the, the original design data, all the operational data that the riser has seen. Uh, once you have looked at the data, you know the condition of the riser, something that is known as condition assessment. Once you know the condition of the riser, uh, you do a life extension fitness assessment, which is assessing analytically and through repairs and modifications that your riser is feasible for the extended life. And as I said earlier, 
CVA looks at all of these process and reports to Bessie as well. Once you have proved to yourself that uh, riser life can be extended further, you submit your applications to Bessie. Uh, of course, you have the forward-looking IMP as well, and you submit to Bessie the application package, and CVA submits their own report. Bessie pays a lot of attention attention to the CVA report and what their findings are. Um, I will talk about in slightly more detail on each of these uh, tasks, so I won't labor on this slide anymore. At the very kickoff, uh, what happens is about uh, five years or so before the end of your design life, uh, BESI usually sends the operator a life extension notification letter. Uh, but even if they don't send it, it is the uh, uh, responsibility of the operator to ensure that you know life extension or decommissioning processes have started uh, by the time the end of design life is uh, reached for the asset. Um, so operator would contact Bessie with either a plan for life extension or for decommissioning of the asset. The more you interact with Bessie, the better it is. Uh, basically, communication is very important in this uh, in this plan. Once uh, you have told Bessie whether you're going to do, uh, let's say uh, you're going to go for life extension, uh, the operators are required to send a verification plan, a plan showing what their, well, uh, how the life extension would be conducted, and also operators would nominate a CVA and submit a nomination package to Bessie. Once Bessie approves of all this, then uh, your life extension process will get started. What is very important is where do we where does the asset stand? Uh, if uh, let's say uh, the asset did not have an integrity management program in place and uh, data has not been looked at recently or data has not been collected, then uh, we would be in the red square shown on the left. Uh, basically, no IM history and your life extension task would be substantial. Uh, on the other side, uh, on the green side, you have a complete IAM history, and life extension is just uh, another assessment initiator, as it is called in API Turim, and so it is not going to be as heavy of a task. And uh, right down the middle uh, between these two is uh, if you have limited IAM history, and I suppose a lot of assets would fall under this category where you will have to do some additional inspections to convince yourself that life can be extended and some additional fatigue assessments. So the first step is data review. Uh, uh, we have divided the data into three parts over here and this is as per API RP2 RIM again. Uh, there is the characteristic data on the very left that tells you how the uh, asset was fabricated and built and, uh, and designed. Uh, at the, at the time the operator started working on uh, through the TTRs, what was the state of the TTRs basically? So that would be looking at design reports, uh, fabrication drawings, component specifications, etc. Uh, then uh, the condition data is there, which tells you how, uh, uh, what conditions the riser faced during the life of its service uh, in the design life. So that would be inspections and uh, any condition monitoring, any internal monitoring or external monitoring, uh, KPIs, environmental data, for example, uh, CP surveys, that sort of thing, or any modifications. Um, the third kind of data is operating data, which would be how uh, the riser was operated. Pressure temperature histories, top tensions for TTRs, endless pressures, and uh, production chemistries, uh, let's say corrosion coupons, uh, CI, uh, corrosion inhibitor programs, so uh, what kind of operations the riser has gone through. And uh, data collection can be a significant task, actually. It is, uh, it is harder than it sounds, because for a lot of older assets, uh, some of the data is not in uh, computerized files. It'll be in, you know, typewritten documents, and sometimes you may not find it if the operatorship has changed hands. So uh, you have to allow for enough time for this data review process. Um, but then you do a gap assessment, for example, on the data. You find out, do you have enough knowledge of the system or do you need to do additional inspections or uh, additional analysis? 
So just showing you two examples of operating data over here. For example, on the left, you can see uh, measured ADCP currents, uh, exceedance. So here you can see that the design curve, uh, the red one, is exceeding the measured currents. So it is a good thing. And your riser didn't see as many uh, uh, bad currents as it was designed for. Uh, another kind of uh, operating data could be, for example, the tensioner cylinder pressures. And from there, you can derive your tensions and see if you were within the design limits or not. Again, these are just some examples that uh, you will see, look at. So once you have looked at the data and uh, you have uh, a thorough understanding of uh, where, where your riser lies, is it uh, has it seen a lot of you know degrading uh, mechanisms or it has not and based on that uh, and if you find gaps in the data for example you will go for inspections and uh, here i'm showing a pie chart of common uh, subsea trap mechanisms and you can see that corrosion cv depletion and fatigue those three account for nearly 50 percent of all damage mechanisms and most of your subsea inspection would be geared towards finding those uh, uh, threats. TTR inspections, uh, number one is visual and uh, easiest one uh, is above water where there are a lot of components that are above water for TTRs. For example, flexible jumpers, the surface tree, uh, air can st uh, stem the deck stops uh, like the one shown on the right and you can uh, identify and manage corrosion on this for example or wear of the uh, of the deck stops uh, some examples are shown here of corrosion and on the bottom picture i believe it uh, reveals the centralizer between the stem and the deck and uh, you can identify uh, whether those are abraded or they need to be upgraded or not just some examples again and uh, uh, subsea visual inspection is, uh, of course, uh, slightly more difficult. And uh, in subsea, uh, you're going to look at the riser pipes to see if there is any coating damage, any uh, cor visible corrosion out there. You can look at the stress joint. And uh, some of the other items that you will look at are inside the air can assembly, like uh, you know the lower stem and the guides. Uh, for these, you will possibly need a mini ROV, which can go inside those intricate, uh, like less accessible areas and look at those uh, guides. Uh, just some examples of uh, anomalies that uh, you can see just by looking uh, from the deck. You know, for example, here you can see some roller bearings that you know restrict the TTR movement inside the deck and. Uh, if they are abraded, uh, for example, how they are shown here, the TTR would lie towards one side and it's going to rattle against the deck. And that can be a big fatigue concern, especially if you have a, a BOP or even the tree on top of the TTR. So uh, some uh, these kind of anomalies you can easily uh, look at. This is a subsea visual inspection. This is a depleted anode, and this one tells you that you need to retrofit an anode to this riser. These are some strake uh, pictures. And on the left, you can see a slipped strake, leaving a little bare section. If you have too many of these bare sections, then your uh, uh, basically VIV suppression is uh, less efficient, far less efficient than it should be. Uh, VIV suppression is also uh, less efficient if you have marine growth on the strikes, like uh, the one shown on the right, uh, where you can barely see the strike profile. So those are some examples of uh, visual inspection. And uh, here, uh, I'm showing you that visual inspection has its challenges, especially when it comes to TTRs. And you can see it on the right is a picture, a little cartoon depicting the TTR. Here it goes inside the keel joint, inside the stem, and it uh, goes through up to the top. And the air can is the stem and this little green structure. And it has its own guides, that the compliant guides. And these are some uh, hull plates that restrict it from moving now this is a very congested area 
to do visual inspections over here, you will probably have to use a mini ROV. And even then, you, you're not sure if you're going to see everything or not. Uh, I put a little mini ROV picture here for uh, uh, for your benefit. And uh, another one is the keel joint right here. Uh, the keel joint, as you can see, is hidden from view from the lower stem. And, uh, you know, it is not easy to look at it. At the same time, it is a very critical item. Um, if the keel ball has fallen off, then there will be excessive fatigue. And also the riser would not be protected if there is an extreme offset. So uh, a visual inspection has its challenges. And most likely, you will need the time to properly assess this uh, uh, the TTR. And you have to give yourself time for life extension. The next step up from visual is uh, non-destructive examination. And uh, above water, uh, typically UT is done. And uh, here I'm showing you a little grid uh, made for uh, UT uh, measurements over here. And uh, you can identify uh, your corrosion pits, whether you need to do coating, um, that sort of things. And sub C and D is, of course, much, much more complicated. And especially for TTRs, where it has a pipe-in-pipe -in -pipe system, you want to look at both pipes. And it is very hard to do so. But there are several technologies you can choose from. And I have listed them here, like MEC, TOFT, phased array, computed tomography, etc. And there are different vendors for all of these. So again, you will need the time to identify what sort of defect are you after? Are you after crack detection, or is it not required? Or uh, BESI doesn't mandate anything, by the way. They say that you have to do a proper uh, NDE. Uh, so uh, multiple factors to consider. Uh, what is the accessibility? What is the death rating? What is the speed of the instrument? So again, you will need uh, time to uh, understand your requirements and you have to do a vendor selection maybe a tool qualification as well so uh, you know these are significant tasks that you have to encounter when it comes to ttr life extension and these are external uh, they will just look at the external uh, riser uh, what about the internal and internal you know uh, Potentially, uh, I suppose you can use tethered pigs, uh, but it's not a ready technology. Uh, and you will have to talk to vendors, and you will have to come up with specific uh, uh, products. And that, again, uh, will be a cost item and a time item as well. And you'll have to remove the tubing. So there are complications associated with it. Uh, with that, I, I just don't want to talk about complications and problems here. So uh, a good enabling technology is computer tomography. This has been used on humans in uh, hospitals for a long time. It is now sub C. And I show you two of the tools that are very popular. One in the middle is the tracer code discovery. Uh, one on the right is the sonomatic inspect CT. And these can look through both pipes and, and you know tell you about wall thickness, the density of the product, and also uh, any defect, any corrosion pits, etc. And uh, these are a bit slow uh, on the flop side of things, but again, these are the only ones that can uh, you can use to look at both the inner riser and the outer riser. And so uh, these are a welcome news to the industry, really. Once you have looked at the TTR fitness for, uh, sorry, uh, TTR inspections, the next thing that you're going to do is analysis. And uh, you'll have to consider the current condition of the riser. So you have to include all of the uh, items that you have found, for example, missing centralizers or, you know, let's say the measure wall thickness is lower. You have to incorporate that in your model. And uh, generally, you'll do fatigue analysis, but sometimes you'll have to do strength as well. If the riser has not been checked, for example, for the post Katrina Rita hurricane criteria, you'll have to do that. Uh, again, BESI mandates that you have to do your analysis for API RP2RD because that is what is there in the CFRs, the Code of Federal Regulations. So uh, that code is to be followed, even though the STD2RD is the new one. And your factor of safety has to be 10 cannot compromise on a factor of safety, uh, not for TTRs at least. 
And uh, when we talk about fatigue analysis, uh, it's not required, but uh, mostly it is done in two phases. Phase one is you look at the conditions from the installation till present and you calculate your fatigue. And phase two is going forward. You find out what kind of fatigue damage rate you predict going forward. You add the two and you find out whether your TTR is uh, you know, good for its extended life or not. Common challenges include uh, our Metocean reports have indicated that uh, typically currents in the Gulf of Mexico, currents in the Gulf of Mexico are more severe than they were 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, they are found to be more severe than they were 20 years ago. Uh, uh, fatigue curves with CP can be more severe and also the different anomalies that the TTR sees. For example, top tension was not within uh, the design limits or the risers were rattling because the guides were not adjusted. Then uh, those, uh, uh, these are the common challenges that will bring down your fatigue life and you have to be very mindful of these. So phase one assessment, uh, as uh, as I said, phase one assessment, you consider the timeline from installation till present. So you'll have to build a timeline. For example, the one shown here at the bottom, uh, you uh, track the different events that happened on the riser. Now, for example, if a different tieback was uh, introduced to the asset and your topside weight increased, so your motions might have changed. Uh, for example, you found marine growth at a particular time, but you cleaned it. So you know, you, you have to consider a certain period of time where the strakes were not clean and VIV suppression was, you know, uh, reduced. So uh, you will have to consider all of these and uh, they all might seem to be uh, bad news for extended fatigue life, but the good news is the analysis process that we have right now and our computational power is much, much more uh, uh, sophisticated than it was 20 years ago. And you can take advantage of that to do very refined fatigue analysis. And oftentimes we find that our fatigue life results can be a lot better than they were in design phase. Then phase two fatigue assessment, which is the period from now until the end of the extended life. This is almost like a new design. Uh, so uh, you will have predicted fatigue damage rates. You have to use the latest Metocean. You know, usually you will do a Metocean analysis. You will find out uh, site-specific sea uh, uh, states. You'll find the site-specific currents, and you will do the analysis. Also, you have to consider all the future planned operations, like you know, if you are going to do call tubing, uh, work through the riser or drilling, etc. And uh, finally, let's say if your life extension is not deemed feasible uh, by your fatigue analysis, then there are different ways you can scale back on the conservatisms. Uh, one way is to do riser monitoring for, let's say, a year or so and prove to yourself and to Bessie that the analysis results are indeed very conservative. Um, you can also do out-of-service inspection or replacement of certain riser joints. Uh, but these are more, I'd say, radical, you know, changes that you will have to consider uh, against the economics of uh, life extension. So uh, uh, let me talk a little bit more about repairs and modifications. Again, uh, when you're doing a life extension assessment, uh, you might find a lot of things that you need to do repairs on. Again, if you had an IM program in place in the first place, then you probably be already on top of these things. And uh, most of you are, uh, but just as an example, uh, for example, you would have these corroded air can fill lines that are shown on the right over here. Or maybe you need to add strakes like the robot is installing over here, uh, some uh, retrofit strakes. For all of these, uh, you do not need to you know, stop production. and. Uh, these are minor repairs, I'd say. Well, not really minor, but, you know, manageable repairs, I'd say. Uh, you might need to add clamps to protect your riser. Uh, in some cases, probably you need to put in the, uh, you need to replace the inner casing. And again, you have to weigh that against the economics of life extension and see if it is really worth doing those or not. Uh, just as an example here, uh, this is something that uh, 2H and Claros did. 
uh, we noticed that on one uh, particular TTR system, the CP readings were outside the limits, you know, they were outside the red limits. So uh, this, and uh, how we knew, knew that before, even before we did CP readings, we saw that the TSA was being activated on the riser. And so that prompted us to look at the CP readings. And we found out that really, yes, the anodes must have been depleted. So uh, for that, uh, we built these retrofit anode slates that can be attached to the riser and the anomaly could be closed out. Again, this was, uh, uh, you know, uh, designed and uh, fabricated uh, through to which and delivered uh, on site uh, and without any disruption to service, really. So once you have done your repairs and modifications and all the analysis, inspections, everything, uh, you need to have your forward-looking IM plan, the integrity management plan. So again, if you have already have an IM program in place, this is just a, a refreshment of the IM plan for forward-looking risks. Otherwise, you have to do the entire IM program uh, from uh, inception. Uh, you have to lay down the foundations of you know the riser. Uh, uh, risk assessment or uh, or any other kind of assessment to assess all the threats that could happen on the riser. And uh, for example, if you do risk assessment, you will rank all of these threats in a uh, criticality matrix. And all uh, based on the criticality matrix and discussions with subject matter experts, you will come up with uh, you know inspection plans like the one shown here or uh, monitoring plans. Uh, for example, how to monitor your corrosion how to monitor environmental data, and also mitigations, what kind of repairs you need to do in the coming years or chemical injections. And this document, the IMP, it has to be a live document that you maintain through the extended life of the field. Uh, finally, you're ready to submit the documents to BESI. So uh, the CVA is going to submit its own riser life extension report, and that is a very critical document, and BESI looks at it in great detail. And operators will themselves uh, submit the riser life extension application package, and inside that package, um, I'm repeating myself over here, uh, you will have the forward-looking IM plan as well. So having uh, talked to you about the riser life extension process, let me touch up a little bit on TRAX GIP. That is something that uh, 2 has uh, uh, is is doing with BP, Shell, and Anadarko Oxy nowadays. And uh, what we have done is uh, basically this TRAX GIP, it stands for Tension Riser Assessment for Continued Service. Uh, what we have noticed is that there is no uh, fixed uh, standardized guideline for life extension. And even BESI is looking at the industry to come up with some guidelines for some robust methods that you can use for TTR life extension. And uh, we thought that it is, uh, uh, I mean, the gap needs to be filled. Uh, there needs to be a life extension process guideline and that will take aspects of both uh, what BESI's requirements are and what integrity management guidelines are for the API uh, to rim. So we have developed a detailed set of uh, guidelines that looks at every TTR threat in great detail. For example, centralizer loss, or for example, the SPAR offset was much higher than uh, what it was designed for. So those things, what to do in those cases and how to assess the risk, what kind of data to get. Uh, so we have come up with these detailed roadmaps for threats like those. And, uh, you know, if you go through those roadmaps, uh, then uh, you can come up with the complete life extension uh, process that you can submit to BESI. And we have run the participant load cases, which uh, are individual TTR uh, systems, and run through those uh, roadmaps, and we have uh, validated the roadmaps like that. Uh, in addition to these roadmaps, we are also issuing analysis guidance, very detailed analysis guidance, you know, what kind of SN curve to look at, what is the hydrodynamic coefficient that you should probably use, uh, that, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, analysis guidelines has been uh, produced. Also, subsea inspection tools. We know TTR inspection or subsea inspection in general is not trivial. We have talked to a number of vendors 
for each vendor, we have found out uh, what is their capability, what is their ready-made tool, what needs to be qualified, and what is the price of these instrumentation. We have come up with a comparison table. And with that, uh, that is all I wanted to talk about in today's presentation. Uh, finally, a summary. Uh, TTRs are uh, the most critical component in an asset life extension, if not the mo uh, one of the most critical components, if not the most critical component. TTR life extension must be based on analysis and inspections both, and the CVA has to do a completely independent analysis. Uh, basic policy right now is to grant no more than 25% of design life with in-service inspections, and uh, most operators would go for in-service inspections, I believe. So uh, that is a bridge that we need to cross. Um, we can do visual inspections and that will cover, let's say 80% of TTR uh, you know, uh, threats. But on top of visual inspection, we have to do NDE as well to convince PESI sometimes. And uh, computer tomography is a good tool for that to see both inner and outer pipes. Fatigue analysis, you must do it for API or P2RD, however, you can reduce design level conservatism based on all the research that has been done in the last 20 years. Uh, finally, you have to submit all of these and an IM plan. So you need a working IM uh, program in place uh, before you submit the package to BESI. And for that, we have been involved with TRAX CIP, which uh, comes up with detailed guidelines on how to do TTR life extension and how to look at all the threats and what all these threats are. So uh, with that, I am concluding my presentation and uh, here are my details if you have additional questions after this. Uh, over to you, Victoria. Yeah, we are going to go ahead and start asking the questions that have come in and if anyone else has any more questions, uh, keep sending them and we'll go through as many as we can. Um, okay, the first question is, what data will you need for the participant load cases in the TRAX JIP? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, in the TRAX JIP, what all participants have done is given the integrity data for one of their TTR systems. And uh, for example, uh, those characteristic data, the condition data, the operational data that I talked about a few slides ago. And we run this data, uh, look at the data and we check uh, all the TTR threats that could happen and see if the data is sufficient to address those or not. And if not, then we do a gap assessment. We come up with additional guidelines for inspections. And uh, we run through the TTR life extension process up to the point where analysis is needed. Uh, we didn't do analysis, but uh, you know we covered, let's say, 60% of the life extension process uh, in track GIP. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, in your opinion, how early should the life extension process be started? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a million dollar question. Uh, from what, what we have heard in, uh, in our meetings and talking to operators who have done this, the five years is a good rule of thumb to at least get started because you, you might need the time, you know, for all these inspections, the qualifying the tool, for example, probably or uh, some monitoring if you have to do that. So you need to have time on your hands to do these things. Okay, um, next question. Um, has Bessie provided formal guidance on the TTR life extension? Uh, it's not formal guidelines. Uh, these are, I'd say, informal guidelines. They gave us, uh, uh, the industry, uh, basically some internal uh, directives. And uh, those are the ones that I'm re reiterating here. Uh, again, these are not formal, and I believe there will be some room for negotiation based on your assessment uh, of the TTR life extension. Okay, um, next question. Does the riser CVA need to do the entire analysis scope, or is it sufficient to do spot checks? Uh, riser. Uh, Actually, yeah, the, that's again a good question. The riser CVA, uh, not the other uh, CVAs like the Hull CVA, they have to do a completely independent fatigue analysis and prove to themselves that the riser is, uh, you know, feasible for life extension or not. It's not just enough to do spot checks of the designer's uh, uh, life analysis and you know compare the results. You have to do the entire uh, life extension analysis uh, by 
themselves. Uh, and that is Bessie's recommendation. Okay. Um, okay, I think this is the last question for now. Um, in your experience, has SUBC NDE been used for TTR life extension inspections? Uh, yes, um, uh, I was uh, touting uh, those uh, computer tomography for a reason. I mean, uh, we know that they have been used uh, in uh, life extension inspections. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how Bessie received them, but uh, they have been used. And, and I believe they have been uh, looked at favorably, if, if I understand correctly. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I think that is all. Yep. That is all the questions we had. So um, thank you, everyone, um, for your time and participation. And thanks, uh, Deanne, for the information on the topic. We hope that everyone found this information useful. And you'll continue to um, join us for more webinars. They're happening every two weeks during our time at home. Uh, you can check out the 2H website and our LinkedIn page. Um, and we're publicizing them all there so you can sign up. And look out for a recording of the webinar in your email in the next 24 hours. And we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you.